We have some great presentations. I don't want to take up any more time that we have together. And I want to, first of all, welcome Stephanie Rago from Multicultural New South Wales, looking at New South Wales growing regions of welcome. So actually, I think it's Kate that's presenting. Sorry. Apologies, Hi, thank you, Katie. David. That's all right. Sorry, it was a very last minute scheduling change. Apologies about that. Steph Rigo can't join us today. Um, I'll just start sharing my screen. Okay. Okay. Please let me know if you can see that okay. Okay, good morning everyone. I'm Katie Baird, Associate Director of Settlement at Multicultural New South Wales, and I'll present on Steph's behalf today. I'd like to thank the organising committee for the opportunity to speak at the conference today. We're very grateful. I'm located on the lands of the Gamerigal people, who are the traditional custodians of the land um, in North Shore, Sydney, and they are part of the Greater Eora Nation. I'd like to pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. I'd also like to introduce our New South Wales Group Partners, Rachel Whiting from RDA Riverina, Annie Harvey from Red Cross and Neil Barber, also from Australian Red Cross. We will have an opportunity to hear from them during the Q&A session today. New South Wales Growing Regions of Welcome, or New South Wales Grow, um, will be operational very shortly in pilot locations of Western Sydney, Murray and the Riverina for the next three years. Years. This pilot has been made possible by funding of $3 million from Training Services New South Wales. GROW is the culmination of several years of research into regional refugee settlement and secondary migration and various community consultations and small-scale initiatives across Australia. From all of this, we have learned that successful regional resettlement takes considered planning and involvement of government's community other services and businesses to make sure that receiving communities are prepared to welcome newcomers and support them in the long term and that arriving newcomers equally feel supported to settle. For the purposes of this program, newcomer is intended as an inclusive term encompassing people from all refugee and refugee-like backgrounds regardless of their visa category. Um, for many regional, as for many regional communities, any new arrival, regardless of their visa category, is welcomed as a newcomer. What you have here is a high level view of the, grow, uh, the New South Wales GROW um, model, which was designed with all of these learnings in mind and based on what regional communities told us was needed in their area. The purpose of GROW is to support coordinated efforts across sectors to create secondary migration linkages between Western Sydney and regional New South Wales and drive sustainable social and economic outcomes for these regions and for newcomers. These are our long-term outcomes. Um, our aims are outlined here. Um, underpinning a lot of this is a, is a collective impact approach to regional resettlement in New South Wales, and I'll talk a little bit about that in a moment and underpinning our approach are guiding principles which have been drawn from international human rights frameworks. And during our foundation laying phase, we've particularly concentrated on a locally led design approach through our regional task forces, which I'll also speak to in a moment. We initially planned to launch GROW in the first half of 2020. Um, however, COVID put a delay on that as it did with many different things. Um, earlier this year in June, we were excited to have the Minister for Multiculturalism and Professor Peter Shergold officially launch the pilot. Um, however, with the latest COVID outbreak, timelines have been slightly impacted a little bit again. The GROW model is attempting to apply a place-based collective impact approach by bringing together diverse voices from all levels of government, service, community and business in a structured way to create a shared vision and achieve social change. And the GROW model has a number of different components that reflect this approach. At high level here, you'll see there are three place-based elements, a Western Sydney regional employment hub and two place-based partnerships in two regions. We also have an overarching steering committee, collective impact and evaluation specialists, and there will be an independent um, program evaluator engaged in the final year of the program. In terms of the components of the model, the steering committee provides strategic oversight of 
program implementation and ensures collaboration between the various components of the model. The committee also connects complementary programs and initiatives to support growth. So it's important to align existing programs and resources to support regional resettlement and to champion place-based approaches across sectors, including government. And the committee will also oversee and monitor the achievement in short and medium term outcomes and identify opportunities to make sure that we collaboratively achieve our long term outcomes. Professor Peter Shergold is our steering committee chair and the committee is made up of representatives from Commonwealth and state governments, subject matter to experts, policy advisors and the three place based elements of the GROW model. Professor Shergold and various members of our steering committee are joining us at the conference today. In terms of our regional employment hub, this is being established in Western Sydney by the Australian Red Cross. The hub will be supported by a coordinator and an advisory group. And the main aim of the hub is to create strong referral pathways between Western Sydney and the pilot regions and help facilitate the relocation of interested newcomers and their families. This will involve having deeper conversations with interested people about their aspirations, their motivations and skills, not only to understand their employment needs, but also lifestyle, education, training, um, other services, faith and cultural needs as well. The hub will ensure that there's tailored matchmaking of newcomers with both in employment and lifestyle opportunities in these regions. Two place-based partnerships have been established in the Riverina and the Murray regions, and each is made up of a regional task force and a backbone coordinator. And one of our newly appointed backbone coordinators is at the conference today. So, hi, Monique. Monique sits with RDA Riverina. The backbone coordinators and the coordinating organisations in which they sit were, and, uh, were identified through a procurement process. So RDA Riverina is the organisation for the Riverina and Red Cross is the organisation for the Murray. The backbone role is really the engine room, which supports task force members, oversees day-to-day -day operational management of the regional strategy and initiatives and connects with the employment hub in Western Sydney. Our task forces make up the regional governance mechanism and they inform a development, the development of a regional body of work, including strategic planning, developing short term outcomes and associated KPIs. So I mentioned the long term outcomes earlier. We have drafted some short and medium term outcomes, which will be further developed and changed if necessary and endorsed by our task forces. The task forces will also monitor overall progress towards objectives and escalate any systemic issues to the steering, the steering committee. And they'll oversee a variety of initiatives. And one such initiative is a short-term project, which we're working together on with Aleem and his team at Welcoming Australia. Our task forces have representatives from across government, community, NGO services, and industry. We have collaboration for impact on board as our collective impact and evaluation specialists, and they've been involved with us throughout the foundational stages of GROW. So it's great to have them continuing with us on this journey. Their role is to facilitate collective impact approaches in the Riverina and Murray, including providing ongoing technical assistance and capacity building for stakeholders to facilitate across sectors and to support them with development of an outcomes framework and associated place-based KPIs that I mentioned. Um, CFI will support each pilot site to continue collect, analyze, interpret, and report data on progress throughout the pilot. And we also have additional funding, as I mentioned, for an end of program independent evaluation. A community readiness assessment tool is being developed um, by CFI in collaboration with our task forces and our steering committee. And we had hoped to present a bit more of a detailed version of this tool today. Um, our same old excuses that COVID has impacted on this time frame as well, unfortunately. Um, but we've started development on this piece of work, which will be a shared measurement mechanism that will allow our task forces to benchmark and identify necessary actions and prioritize priorities to strengthen their readiness to welcome newcomers. So the focus will be in terms of exploring what is already in place. Um, so what are the current enablers in the community and identifying any gaps or um, areas to be improved. The tool itself is being developed according to specific domains that align with 
both with the National Settlement Framework and the New South Wales Human Services Outcomes Framework. And the latter is something that we're using at Multicultural New South Wales and across various agencies and government to develop programme specifications as well as monitoring and evaluation frameworks. The tool will help us understand what the employment and education landscape is like in Asian, how accessible and available services are, um, I guess services that are appropriate to our newcomer cohorts, um, and who is already working together in this space. And it will also give us a, a sense of community sentiment in the region, which um, may have shifted throughout COVID. Um, so I guess just to, to sum up the the um, the I, I, the 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 underpinning sorry the underpinning um, a, a principle of grow is that we're talking about long term settlement and this has been mentioned in some of the some of the, the presentations this morning so this is obviously employment is important but we're not just talking about people moving to the regions for jobs the people that we hope to attract will want to establish themselves in regional New South Wales and settle there. And we'll have an opportunity to speak to our three partners during the Q&A session. Thank you. Thank you very much, Katie. Um, we really look forward to hearing more developments of, of how GROW uh, is implemented and the things that we can learn from that. Much appreciated for you and your colleagues. Uh, I'm Chairman. I'm also a presenter for this um, session. So my presentation is, um, again, a collaboration with colleagues from the University of South Australia, Charles Sturt University, and a community partner, the Multicultural Communities Council of South Australia. And uh, I just want to acknowledge that I'm presenting from Ghana land, a traditional custodians of the place where I am and pay my respect to elders past, present and emerging. You know, there are now several initiatives that seek to encourage local government councils to take up the banner of being a welcoming town for migrants and refugees. And this paper considers how one country town facilitates a whole of community approach to becoming a real welcoming community. Second slide. This paper is based on research undertaken in 2020 and 21 in Leeton, in New South Wales regional shire with a population of around 11,500. It's a mixed methods approach. Uh, and the town of Leeton has humanitarian skilled and seasonal migrants. This particular paper is based on semi-structured interviews that we took with Hazara Afghan humanitarian migrants members of the local community and representatives of migrant support service groups from Wagga and Griffith. Interviews focused on the experiences of settlement for the Hazara and local rural community. We are a caring community that welcomes refugees, migrants and new settlers are proudly written on signs placed in prominent parts of the town, but a welcoming community requires more than a statement on a sign. If it is to be more than a sign, a marker for community identity, uh, Sarah, that's just gone a little bit ahead if it's on a timer. Thanks. If it's going to be more than a sign, then it needs to be this needs to be demonstrated in words, actions, and strategies. Sign three. The mayor put it this way. We can put up the sign and say, well, that's nice because we feel good about putting it up but we had to get the community to accept that they needed to be a part of that. It couldn't be about just myself and the council saying, we're just going to do it. We emphasize to our community the importance of being inclusive and having a connection. It's welcoming refugees, migrants, and new settlers to our town. There has to be a combination. We all have to be shown that we're all in this together. This paper outlines a number of different ways in which the town puts these words into practice. It's summed up in the words of the mayor and the multicultural development officer who stated, the whole of community approach is most important. No one is ever left behind. Next slide. The whole of community approach refers to two strategies. The first recognizes that supporting humanitarian migrants requires engaging the whole of the rural community, not just a few, to support these new arrivals. 
The second recognizes that supporting humanitarian migrants needs to be done in a way that does not isolate them as a special group, but is inclusive of all migrants, locals and indigenous sections of the rural community. Next slide. Of course, it begins with the local government authority, the local council, with intentional support through structured responses to refugee migrant needs in the community, including making sure that it is, it is placed in their council, strategic policies, procedures, and deliverables. As the mayor said, to get something in the council delivery program means it becomes a whole of council approach, and then it becomes a whole of community document with whole of community support. So you're not seen to be going outside on your own little pet project. The role of the council also involves um, in securing grants to support the refugee community, but, but other migrant and locals as well. In one particular case, the council got a grant for mental health and resilience post COVID. And the multicultural support worker commented, we don't take this grant and its provisions uh, we, and equ we want to equally train foot soldiers from different communities, the Hazara, Pacific Islanders, East Africans, First Nations people who are equally struggling to settle into the community. We focus primarily on people who've come in and are vulnerable, but then also for locals. You don't want sentiments around a small town. It's just migrants who are favoured. The role of the mayor, next slide, is also really crucial. The mayor is a respected individual who holds great weight in the community and their public visibility and voice has been a key feature of the local town's response to building a welcoming community for humanitarian background migrants. Is it possible to get the next slide? The mayor is the one we were told because the mayor knows and the mayor is out there in the community in all sorts of events. I would call him our brand ambassador. Well, the local council and the mayor are also key in responding to opposition and antagonism in the community to refugees and new migrants. The mayor spoke of a, a situation where the, the signs that they had put up were actually graffitied a few years ago. And he commented, um, we've done this in the spirit of what we should be doing. Next slide. We've done this in the spirit of what we should be doing as a community, to embrace others in the community. I acknowledge that some people may not be happy with what we're doing, but I also acknowledge that we have a right and responsibility as a council to make sure that people can feel comfortable coming and living in our shire. As well as the council and the mayor, there was a development of a local support group called the Leeton Multicultural Support Group, made up of volunteers and also included the mayor. This volunteer group helped to connect the local community and resources together, whether it be issues of employment, legal issues, housing, education, Hazara culture and religious needs, working with local media to promote positive stories. Equally, the multicultural support group recognized that effort was needed to build friendships with the Hazara so that they would feel safe and welcome. Next slide. So what can we do? we were told, we can't take on all the problems of the world, but one thing we can do, we can make people feel comfortable and feel some friendship within and warmth within our society. The group, of course, was involved in promoting language learning, and particularly English. And this wasn't just the formal TAFE courses that people could take during the day or in the evening. It was recognized that there need to be conversation opportunities informal on weekends. So this kind of informal support was also really key, whether it would be the spontaneously going out to, to movies together with local people, as one said, now that's what we really want to see happen. But they also noticed that the Hazara women were not able to mix like men. So Kate and Jane um, from the multicultural group started a morning tea and a coffee group, and they just get together and have a cup of coffee and sit and talk. Next, um, next slide, please. And so it was contact, it was familiarity. It was that feeling again of being included, of belonging and really having a chance to relax and to ask any questions 
they wanted, including issues of raising children and the like in the local community. The Multicultural Support Group, together with the council, were involved in facilitating public forums and events to educate and alleviate fears and to promote understanding and acceptance, responding to questions of refugee legitimacy. It was a messaging to the community. Next slide, please. We had to get that message out to the community, not just me, the mayor, not just a few of our members, but we had to get the community to accept that what we were doing was a great thing for society. Once we were able to show them that these people wanted a job, they were not coming out here to take something from Australia, they were coming out here to have a chance of life in Australia. Next slide, please. It also involved hearing from the refugees themselves. It was important that the local community heard from the mayor and the multicultural support group, but it was also important to hear firsthand. And they went to groups such as Rotary and Lions and in local schools. They actually gave their life story of why they left their country, why they came to Australia and their hardship along the way. It was a big thing because they were able to talk themselves. And there were a lot of people asking questions, tradies, business people, men and women. Another key feature was facilitating cultural and social interaction. Community events were important opportunities to build understanding and interaction. The research team identified at least three levels of events that promoted social interaction, beginning with the broadest and least social interaction to the deepest. Next slide, please. And of course, this begins with things like Harmony Day, which we're all familiar with, more formal recognition and support of cultural diversity. But the local community felt like this needed to go much deeper. And they started something they called Chill and Grill. If you pick up an afternoon for chill and grill and you bring your deck chair and just sit out in the park all day, it's a big deal because it's what allows locals to participate. If you say Harmony Day, they say, oh no, that's only for migrants. We don't have anything essentially Australian that was welcoming them. So we thought let's pick up an event, an already local town centric event, and then bring representatives from other cultures to participate, something the reverse of Harmony Day. It also involves, on a third level, spontaneous everyday friendship events, the kind of organic ways in which people can connect together. Next slide, please. The mayor said, I take them down to the river. I show them where the ski beach is. They can go fishing, play soccer, rugby. We're trying to give them more of an overall bonding, a way of doing. Not just that we like them being here, we want to celebrate than being here. Of course, those connections, next slide, often mean that you need to go beyond the call of duty. The mayor spoke of an example where refugees had their homes broken into and robbed, computers and phones were stolen, and they had difficulty engaging with the police. And he went on to say, so when they went around to the police station to make statements, I went with them. I said, don't be fearful, I'm with you. This paper has explored the experiences of one rural town and some ways in which they've imagined themselves as a welcoming community, the right fit. It involves formal and informal engagement. The whole of community approach of this town recognizes that supporting humanitarian migrants re requires engaging the whole of the rural community, not just a few. It also recognizes that approaches to supporting humanitarian migrants needs to be done in a way that does not isolate them as a special group, but is inclusive of all migrants, locals and indigenous sections of the rural community. Thank you. Thanks Sarah for keeping me in check as well. Well done David, you were spot on. <laughs> <laughs> um, the third presentation is by Lisa Button, the Community Refugee Sponsorship Program how community sponsorship programs can help establish the right fit. Thank you, Lisa. Um, thank you, David, and hello, everyone. It's really wonderful to um, be contributing to this fantastic conversation today. So much wisdom shared already today. Um, I'd like to acknowledge that I am zooming in from the land of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation and pay my respects to elders past, present and emerging. 
I'm just going to uh, try and share my screen. Hopefully that will go smoothly um, and jump right into my presentation. Um, so just very quickly a word about who we are because um, we're, we're a relatively new organisation, Community Refugee Sponsorship Australia, often referred to as CRESA. We're an independent Australian charity um, operating nationally, currently funded by philanthropic and other non-government donors. And we've been working since 2018 to ad advocate um, to federal policy uh, makers for the introduction of a, a Australian uh, refugee sponsorship program inspired by that wonderful Canadian refugee sponsorship program that so many people are familiar with. And just for those who perhaps aren't as familiar, uh, a, a quick summary, that program has been running since the late 1970s and has enabled ordinary um, everyday Canadians to sponsor uh, more than 325,000 refugees into um, the Canadian community, in addition to those who come through the government um, assisted program. And sponsor groups provide financial support as well as core settlement support to refugee newcomers for um, usually a 12 month period. This approach, I think, is particularly pertinent to the conversation around regional settlement because it has shown, as, as Alison Larkins mentioned this morning, um, a viable way of uh, facilitating primary settlement of refugees into regional locations in a way that has very strong retention outcomes. Um, and there are now about a dozen countries around the world who are following this basic model, including the UK and Ireland and Germany and um, New Zealand is about to revamp their pilot program. And in all of those countries, there is a very strong regional and rural dimension to these programs. Um, and I'll talk a little bit more about why that is and why it's inherently um, a, a, an interesting and suitable um, policy tool for those working in regional um, settlement. Um, there's no employment criteria usually in these programs, but um, the, the Can Canadian data tells us that the majority of sponsored refugees do find employment of some sort within the first year of arrival and are well supported in um, building and improving their careers over time. And there's also some very well documented language and integration benefits of this approach. Um, as an organisation, in addition to our advocacy and research work around this future model, um, we're currently implementing a, a program, we call it the Group Mentorship Program. It's essentially a precursor to a full sponsorship program, we hope, in the future, while we wait for um, the federal government to uh, respond on its review of the current community support program in Australia and the recommendations of the, the review that was led by Peter Shergold and Margaret Piper and Karen Benson back in 2019. So I'm going to tell you just a little bit about that pilot program and some of the things that we've um, learned from it and, um, and then make some observations about um, why it's reinforced our belief that um, the community sponsorship model is something that can really help in the regional settlement context. Um, so this pilot program was introduced by us last year in the context of the pandemic. You know, we had hoped to be supporting and, and working with government around a full sponsorship program, but of course with COVID um, resulting in our international borders being largely closed. Um, you know, we had to do the pivot like many other organisations and think, well, how, how can we demonstrate as well as build the um, the tools that we need um, to see a sponsorship program work in Australia. Um, so we developed this idea of training local volunteer groups to work with refugees who are already in the country, however they came to be here, um, purely in their settlement journeys. Um, so we looked to find local volunteer groups of five or more adults who are prepared to provide six to 12 months of wraparound support for a whole refugee household. So you're talking about a group of individuals who are not necessarily related to one another, but live in the same general geographic area, supporting a refugee household, one group per one household. Um, and the idea was what would be um, provided in addition to whatever other support that household had, whether through HSP or SETS or other government funded or indeed um, non-government funded programs. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd say in general, it was a, it was a great success. Um, I've got a, a slide coming up that's got some of the data around how big this program was, but 
um, to, to skip over that for a moment, we, we decided to extend the program into the, the current financial year. Um, and that was before the, the Afghanistan crisis happened and uh, you know, the Afghan um, evacuation um, and the future flow of refugees from that um, situation has just re, uh, re-emphasised for us um, the relevance and perhaps importance of this kind of approach, um, particularly given the outpouring of um, offers of support from within the Australian community. I, I see this as a, uh, a once in a decade opportunity. Um, and we'll hope, hopefully we don't get crises like this too often, but when you do get them, it's an opportunity to bring in new stakeholders who aren't currently active or weren't previously Obviously, active in refugee um, issues and bring them into the conversation. And if that, if they can become involved through the Afghan crisis, um, once they've got their eyes open to refugee issues, you know that that's going to flow on to other um, uh, other initiatives in the future. Um, so, just in terms of um, the, the pilot program, um, essentially we. Uh, We located and trained and vetted um, 21 mentor groups around the country. We we aim for this to be a national uh, program, but um, unfortunately, colleagues in WA and and South Australia didn't quite get ready in time, but they're coming in on the next one. Um, But from northern Queensland right down to southern Tasmania, uh, we had groups around the country that put their hands up to essentially help us um, innovate and trailblaze this new um, approach. And it is a new approach. Um, while we're inspired by the Canadian program, um, we, we're we trying to build something that's uniquely Australian. It's not Canada, it's not the UK, it's not the old CRSS, it's something quite different and new. Um, so we had uh, 172 uh, individual volunteers around the country involved in this program. In the end, we had about um, 19 refugee households who benefited from support of this approach. And um, we have an evaluation uh, available on our website. But the takeaway message was, while there are definitely things we can continue to um, problem solve and refine, both the the mentor groups and the refugee mentees reported very positive experiences um, with with refugees reporting support with employment, education, learning to drive, English, friendship, and so forth. And if I have time, I might play you a snippet of a video towards the end. Um, We had a range of organisations across the existing settlement ecosystem um, involved in the the pilot program in various capacities. Um, And it's really helped us solidify what are the key principles and tools that are needed um, in the sponsorship ecosystem um, in in the future. One is the idea that it's very much a group-based volunteering or sponsorship activity. This is not about one person sponsoring another person. The strength and the magic in, you know, the the wonderful outcome that the Canadians get through this program is the fact that you have a group of people that's inherently strong and resilient because, you know, if one person moves out of the community or one person gets busy and loses interest, um, there's four or five or six others there to, to step in. And it's also the um, sort of almost exponential network individuals involved in um, the sponsor group that makes it so powerful. Every individual has four or five or six um, professional and social networks that they're tapping into for the benefit of the um, refugee and newcomer that they're working with. Um, the other principle is that people are, the, the, the sponsor group or the mentor group are self-directed innovators. They're not told, you know, you have to turn up on a Tuesday evening between seven and nine and do this task. They are introduced to a household and told your brief is to get to know the household, find out what their strengths are, find out what their aspirations are, find out what their challenges are, and then see how you can work with them to help them solve those challenges. Um, And that it's a simple idea, but it's probably the most complex part of this whole um, work is that how to how to um, make that happen at a national level in a responsible way, but without suffocating that that innovation and problem solving from local stakeholders. Um, Related to that is the idea that those volunteers, they're screened, they're trained and they're trusted. Um, So we put them through things like working with children checks and national police checks, 
We um, have adapted a training program that we inherited from the Global Refugee Sponsorship Initiative and all of the mentor um, group members go through that program. Um, and then having done that, you, you trust them. Um, but again, another element of being able to trust is that people are well supported. So we, we tried to set up a network of support around those individuals, including online resources, regular national um, online forums where groups can talk to one another about um, their learnings and their experiences, as well as hear from expert speakers from within the settlement ecosystem on topics like, you know, how to help people with um, torture and trauma or people facing domestic violence or other um, more specialised areas. Um, so to, to sort of wrap up and hopefully leave a little bit of time for a video, um, perhaps someone can just give me, I, I think I've got two minutes to go. Um, uh, it is an inherently place-based approach. Um, this, this framework really flips the dynamic between, you know, the national and the local. You need a national framework for this. But the people and the communities who do the welcoming are self-selecting. They are assessing their landscape and saying, we believe that our community could make a good home for, you know, refugee newcomers um, and then initiating the migration of uh, people into that community. Um, it's a whole of family approach. Um, it's not about support for one person or another person. It's, it's inherently holistic and um, organic and adaptable. Um, uh, the, the local sponsors investigate all of those needs that are required at a local level, housing, employment, um, uh, settlement infrastructure, um, as experts in their own community. And it enables communities to start small and grow their local intake over time. It's, as a community, you don't have to commit to, you know, taking 200 or 300 or 500 refugees over a period of time. You can say, let's let's... Um, let's welcome one family or let's welcome three families um, and see how we go from there and what, what capacity we do in fact have. Um, and it allows local sponsor groups to bring in local institutions and introduce um, newcomers to local services and employers. So when we talk about sponsor groups, we're, we're largely agnostic as to who those sponsor groups are. The sponsor group could be formed out of an employer community. It could there could be a big employer who says we really want to welcome more refugees here to um, boost our workforce. I do that through the prism of. Um, a sponsorship um, group so that they're not just providing employment, they're actually providing all that social support and, and other wraparound support. It could be initiated by um, local government, but local government in conjunction with local volunteers who are going to be the people who take that person to the police station on a Saturday night because they've been robbed or, um, you know, give them advice on, to, on how to get emergency dental treatment for a, a kid who's got terrible toothache um, at three in the morning. Uh, you need those volunteers. Um, and the final thing I'd just say is it's, it's not a low bar um, participating in this kind of program. Local sponsors um, have to uh, really have some skin in the game before they welcome the refugees. If, if you follow, you know, the Canadian style model, there's a financial component as well as investing in training and doing your due diligence. And by the time you're there, you know, with the welcome sign at the airport or, um, you know, hopping off the, uh, the bus, um, that, that local group is deeply invested in the success of the newcomer um, and will, uh, without being asked, do an awful lot to, uh, to help pave the way for them. Um, I don't think I'm going to have time for the video, um, but I will put it in the chat in case anyone wants to see what this approach looks like in practice. Um, and I will also... Oh, hang on. Community sponsor. And um, I'll just show the slide for a minute uh, to, to provide my contact de details if anyone wants to get in touch. Uh, given that we're running this mentorship program again, if any of you work for organisations uh, who know of refugees who are interested in relocating into regional locations, we have a number of um, mentor groups in regional New South Wales, Victoria, Queensland and Tasmania 
who are very, very keen to welcome refugees but are having have trouble finding the people who want to come there. Um, if you represent a regional community who's interested in welcoming refugees through a volunteer-led approach, um, would love to hear from you and anyone who's interested in just understanding or help, indeed helping us to develop the community sponsorship model um, in Australia and that vision, we'd love to hear from you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Lisa. Uh, next presentation will be from Sarah Faulkner. Sarah is a PhD student at UniSA, and she's going to be speaking on the role of places and natural landscape in facilitating belonging during settlement. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, David. And had I known, Lisa, or that I should have spoken about Canadian sponsorship, because um, I'm mixing things up a little bit. My research actually took place um, on the island of Newfoundland. So I'd like to pay my respect to the um, Inu and the Inuit people of the island of Newfoundland in Canada, where this research took place. Um, while it is Canadian settlement um, in an Australian co conference, um, I'd like to highlight that this is actually in the context of regional, rural and remote settlement. So to think of it in that lens, um, the island of uh, Newfoundland um, is an island on the uh, northeast coast of Canada. It's about uh, 400,000, 400 square kilometers, sorry, but six times the size of Tasmania, but the same number of people. So about 40% of the people live in the capital of St. John's, and it's that's basically about 200,000 people. So overall, there's 500,000 people over four. So it's quite a rural and rugged place. It's marked by a uh, rugged landscape. Um, it's uh, marked by uh, subsistence living off of the ocean and the land. And um, in the history, uh, Newfoundland has been a place, actually a bit of a revolving door for settlement um, historically. A lot of migrant and refugee communities have been settled there um, from the uh, Indo-Chinese refugees in the 1970s. Um, we had a, a large number of Bulgarian refugees in the 80s, and, and most recently a uh, number of Syrian refugees settled since 2015. But historically, what the problem with the island is that um, people come and they stay for a year and don't stay. And so the island of Newfoundland has been doing a number of things and migrants in the past. However, it's a difficult place because it's so rooted in, its, in, in regional history, it's so rooted in historical isolation, um, and it, it suffers socioeconomically for employment. One thing that the island does have going for it, it's a beautiful place um, in regards to natural environment and landscape. Tourism ads, if you go on a plane to Canada, you will no doubt be bombarded with an ad for tourism in Newfoundland and come to see our lovely landscape. But what um, a lot of agencies haven't focused on in the past is actually the significant role it plays for my G communities in supporting their sense of belonging and home and the importance of place and importance of connecting to land and to landscape in facilitating a sense of belonging. And so when I went to Newfoundland to do my research, I was mainly exploring Syrian refugee sense of place belonging or home on the island. Um, and I spent about nine months there from January of 2020 till September. So of course it was COVID time. So my research involved a combination of both online and in-person methods. But what it was really grounded in um, primarily was what Tillman Healy calls friendship ethnography. But that's really just treating people with a mutual respect and um, uh, through understanding and, and growth. And so it's taking the time to build relationships with people. It's uh, staying for cups of tea and having multiple meals beyond just the interview portion. It's investing um, and contributing to whatever aspects of their life um, that is significant to them. Um, and so I put, conducted a lot of what's called non-sedentary methods or co-experience, which is just a fancy way of saying I literally got my hands dirty. Um, there was a number of Syrian farmers who invited me onto the farm that they worked for the summer and to spend time, you know, cultivating fields and fields of carrots and picking up cabbages and doing whatever they do on the land. And that was actually a really key moment for me in learning about the significance of land and people's relationship to place and to the natural environment, particularly for these men who make their living off of the off of farming. And so beyond that building of relationship through actually going actively going along and participating, I also did a number of online interviews and in-person interviews, time spent in people's homes, and to supplement the ethnographic fieldwork. 
Um, and another really key method that really instilled the importance of place, particularly natural places, was the use of photo elicitation. So some people, when we did virtual interviews to support their conversation, shared photos. They were invited to share any photos that they would like of their settlement. And through that, it was a real beautiful discussion and really raised the profile of Newfoundland as a place and the different places that people engage in and the role it played in their sense of place belonging or sense of home. Um, and this was it very early on in my research into the island, the idea around the, the draw of the island, the draw of the natural environment to people, but also its relationship that it's not just a place in isolation, it's not just an iceberg or a beautiful landscape, but it's also the connection that people have to the people of that place as well. And so the two working together and how they facilitate those connections as being really important. Um, this was from a community stakeholder who had lived away for a number of years and moved back. And, and she just talked about the ocean drawing to her and um, calling her back. And so that this was very, very one of the very first interviews that I did. But throughout my entire process, this kind of narrative was repeated not only by community stakeholders, but majority by Syrians alike. Um, and so the natural island itself was raised a lot in people's stories about the island, just talking about their experience, um, just the beauty of the landscape, snow, which historically has been made the, given the excuse to being the reason why people have left in the past. Um, but what I've found is actually that while Newfoundland does get a lot of snow, um, when I was there, they actually went to a state of lockdown for six days because they had so much snow um, that people couldn't leave their homes. It actually also acted as a facilitator for people to connect to their neighbors, to get out shoveling, to actually have conversations. So the snow and the landscape and the natural environment actually do some really wonderful things to facilitate connections that haven't been talked about previously. But most important for today's presentation, I'd like to kind of highlight the natural, the role of natural places in really important ways of people connecting to the environment um, in a series of ways. Um, Brun calls it re-territorializing place, but really it's people who've been disconnected or who've lost their connections to places of their homeland, uh, many, such as you know, refugees going through the refugee experience and being um, have forced to leave. Her idea of re-territorializing place means really just help providing opportunity for people to remake or reconnect, um, that it, that's potential. People can rebuild a connection to a sense of home again, and it's how that's being facilitated and supported. So a lot of the natural places actually support people to rebuild and re-territorialize memories um, that are um, of shared memories of family and friends together. Um, there's also a concept called nodding relationships, um, and it's also referred to as weak social ties. And that's similar to what I mentioned about the shoveling snow. It's how people can engage with other people in their community through informal networks or nodding. And it's actually been shown to support a lot of refugee and migrant groups um, to build informal networks, to do information sharing, um, and also just to feel a sense of belonging. And so natural places provide sources for that to happen or what Littner calls positive spaces of micro spaces of, of intercultural encounters. So social encounters between all different groups, and it provides those neutral places and spaces where people can get together and to kind of have those relationships and share. Um, and the best example I can kind of give about that is this place called the beach. Uh, across every interview for those who lived on the eastern side of the island, the exact same beach by name, by location was mentioned as everyone's favorite place and where they felt a sense of belonging to the island. A lot of it involved stories around this particular beach. Uh, for those who were lived in the central or the western side of the island, there was a beach equivalent. It was either a particular river that was really well known or it was, a, it was something that was next to a lake, but it was always involved in an environmental aspect or environmental place. And being able to access those places played a significant role in people's sense of belonging. They provided sources of conviviality. And David, I'm sure you know this title very well um, through your research, but it's basically opportunities for people to socially connect and to get together and to build positive memories and positive remaking of place. It also, a lot of natural places provide opportunities for people to feel a sense of safety and peace um, and build a, a sense of emotional attachment and familiarity to the island and to its uh, landscape. And so as a place of conviviality, you know, this beach, um, it provided opportunities for Syrian families to get together, 
um, like they used to do in their countries before, the activities that were instilled. And, and that was something that was raised by a number of participants, the importance of being out in the environment, being outside in nature for a lot of Syrians when they were settled there. And Newfoundland being just a great fit for them in that regard. Um, in, the, in a memory shared by one participant, her fondest memory of time on the island, it was a day outing with a women's group where they could roast marshmallows and be around friends. And so it's like facilitating those social connections with people and providing that opportunity that this landscape really, really provided, this beach provided. Um, it's the main beach where people go. Uh, they talk about, we have a lot of memories at this beach. We enjoy spending time with each other. And so that rebuilding of memories, that remaking of place, being facilitated through that natural landscape and that connection, and that beach as being a central point of that. It's also really great you know, for family relationships. It's uh, a place where a lot of Syrians have a lot of children that settle on the island. A lot of them were sponsored with um, at, least, at least two, sometimes upwards to nine. Nine children. So it's a place where you could go and you could have large family barbecues. It's safe for kids. They can throw uh, rocks in the water. And so that opportunity for social conviviality being really significant for people. Um, and it's, you know, the chance they could do that. It's, and when I asked, you know, what, why this beach? Why is it so important? Just a lovely place. It's too beautiful. It's kind of the narrative that everyone expressed. But beyond just being a lovely place, it's also a place where people go sometimes for contemplation. Um, the importance of being able to engage and sit. Um, some people talked about it being where they could connect with their with their God, and they find that religious sense of peace. Others sometimes it's just they go and they sit together and they have opportunities to sit and have a coffee. Husband and wife spoke about it's their therapy where they just go and sit and have a chat, and also it's. It's, you know, a place of relaxation. And this is not the particular beach in the East Coast, but again, in Central Island, if it wasn't a beach, it was some type of natural landscape, like a river, um, where they could sit and, and be at peace, um, and, or where they could connect to previous loved ones. Um, this, in this case, the woman talked about, I feel like I'm free. My mom loved nature. So she, she feels like she's closer to her mother when she goes to this particular spot on the island and being close to, with just close to the ocean, she can contemplate. And so the importance of that in people's sense of, of place, the sense of being able to rebuild it, um, and the peaceful space that they're able to engage in, um, that the island itself, being supported and facilitated to access these places is really important. And I don't have time to get into some of the barriers to actually being able to get to some of these natural places, which is another conversation altogether. But it just kind of highlights the importance of really allowing that opportunity and facilitating the opportunity for people to engage with those natural environments in the settlement experience and the difference that is made in the, in the Syrian settlement on the island of Newfoundland. So that's it. Thank you. And references if people want it. <laughs> Thank you, Sarah. You were exactly on to your 12 minutes, so that was perfect.